first senior will be Amity Ely. She has, uh, her thesis is titled, Musical Brains, The Way Music Affects Us Neurologically. Please welcome Amity Ely. has a huge impact on our culture and how we use music affects our brain. Playing an instrument and studying music as a child have profound effects on the brain and in terms of memory and coordination, but also how we think emotionally and spiritually. But why learn as children? Why not begin musical training as an adult? Children's habits determine how our days will be oriented as adults. Therefore, it is crucial to cultivate good habits as children the brain attempts to make almost any daily task into a habit to save energy because our brain is constantly looking for ways to save effort. When the brain makes a routine into a habit, attention can shift to something else. This is similar to how God's Word changes us when we read it. By reading and reviewing God's Word, we recognize the world around us and the people around us as a gift and use His Word to glorify Him. Reading God's word changes us because he can fix people through his word. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. On the contrary, if we disobey our parents and ignore our friends' advice, we will view everything around us as a burden because our sin blinds our eyes from selfishness. Training our, bo our, bo our brain and our body into wisdom and faith takes a constant reading of scripture. Without reading the scriptures, we drift and wander according to instinct instead of thinking before we act. As C.S. Lewis says in his book, Mere Christianity, the first step is to recognize the fact that your moods change. The next is to make sure that if you have once accepted Christianity, then some of its main doctrines shall be deliberately held before your mind for some time every day. That is why daily prayers and religious readings and church going are necessary parts of the Christian life we have to be continually reminded of what we believe. Lewis goes on to explain that faith must be fed and that most ex-Christians did not get argued out of Christianity, but simply did not train themselves in it. We cannot change our sinful ways without yielding to Christ and heeding his word. So constantly reading God's word helps us to realize our faults and create new habits to fulfill God's good purpose. His good purpose being conforming to the likeness of his son. Romans 8, verse 29. When we put into practice the Christian virtues, it changes the way we think. Practicing these virtues sharpens our reticular attention, which is the process of learning something and being able to recognize it in our everyday lives. Christianity should not only consist of faith, but good works. Habits greatly affect the good works we do throughout the day. While this can consist of even the smallest thing like brushing your teeth, this essay will focus on the habit of playing instruments. Listening to and playing music is one habit that not only affects how we see the world, but affects our brain by creating new pathways in the brain that make it more efficient in thinking. One formidable task that we pursue as children is making music by singing or playing an instrument. Much like crawling before we can walk or run, we learn to play the piano or any other instrument by studying the basic beginner level foundations like finger exercises and scales. These skills are key to advancing in ability and expertise. By learning to play an instrument, we discipline ourselves and overcome the tasks that seem too difficult. A quote from James K. A. Smith's Urology Love, learning virtue or being conformed to Christ is more like practicing scales on the piano than learning music theory. The goal is, in a sense, for your fingers to learn the scale so that they play naturally, as it were. Learning here isn't just information acquisition. It's more like describing something into the very fiber of your being. Playing an instrument makes us more aware of the instrument when heard and helps us to see the glory of it. You should not play an instrument only because your parents told you to. Of course, obey your parents, but have a thankful heart in it by recognizing that it will be a blessing to others. The child that cleans his room solely for the purpose of getting attention from his parents does not feel fulfilled because as soon as the praise ends, he seeks more. The child that cleans his room for his parents and takes pleasure in it, not only feels fulfilled, but appreciates the work his parents gave him to do. 
He recognizes the gift of parents or guardians and wants to please them because that is what God wants you to do. By having a thankful heart, for taking the time every every day, oh sorry, I lost it. By th having a thankful heart for taking the time every day to practice the piano or other instruments, we grow into appreciation for the work God has blessed us with, and we redeem our time through it. Ephesians 5 verse 16. Learning to play an instrument grows our self-discipline, but it also has neurological effects on us. Playing an instrument and reading sheet music advance not only reading ability and writing skills, but also our muscle memory. Remembering the basic scale on the piano helps even professional pianists play more efficiently because scales are the foundation of any piece, which refers back to James Smith's book because the foundations are in the fiber of your being. Another quote from the same book, such moral kingdom reflecting dispositions are inscribed into your character through rhythms, routines, and rituals, and acted over and over again that implant in you a disposition to an end or tell us that becomes a character trait a sort of learned second nature default orientation that you tend toward without thinking about it. To understand the effects of the brain that the music has on the brain better, I'm going to give you a very simple course of the basic anatomy of the brain and what parts of the brain control what functions. And to help understand that better, I have this colored diagram, which I hope most of you can see. But um, the yellow is the cerebrum. I'll, I'll get into this in a bit, but the yellow is the cerebrum. Uh, the red is the corpus callosum. Uh, the green is the brain stem. This very small orange part is the pituitary gland. This light blue is the hypothalamus. And this is the brain stem, or the spinal cord, and this is the cerebellum. But now I will get into the more complicated things. The brain has five main parts, as I mentioned before. The cerebrum, the cerebellum, the brain stem, the pituitary gland, and the hypothalamus. The cerebrum has two hemispheres that communicate with one another through the corpus callosum which is a connection of myelinated neurons that allow the two hemispheres to communicate. And for those of you who don't know what myelinated means, it just means that the neurons are covered in this white fatty substance called myelin, which allows the neurons to communicate. The left hemisphere controls things like speech and mathematical reasoning, and the right hemisphere controls things such as music, emotions, and interpretations of social cues. The cerebellum controls voluntary functions such as muscles, posture, eye movements, coordination, and the ability to gauge the weight of something before picking it up. The brainstem controls involuntary functions necessary for living like breathing and maintaining the heart rate. The pituitary gland, also known as the master gland, tells certain glands to produce hormones. And the hypothalamus, otherwise known as the master of the master gland, uh, controls hormones and then sends the hormones to the pituitary gland. Another area of the brain is called the cerebral cortex, which is within the cerebrum, which was not on the diagram. But it can be split into many sections, three of them being the motor cortex, visceral, and the sensory cortex. The motor cortex controls planning and sending signals to the brain to move certain parts of the body. The visceral cortex is involved in taste and autonomic control. The sensory cortex controls somatic sensations, which are responsible for receiving pain, temperature, and detecting touch. Studies have shown that under an MRI scan, listening to music fires up multiple areas of the brain, uh, of them being the cerebrum, motor cortex, visceral cortex, and sensory cortex all at once. Even further, playing an instrument causes hundreds of spots in each area of the brain to light up, making it look like a fireworks show. And I have another picture here uh, of the brain. Uh, this is an MRI scan. But this is the brain at rest. And this is specifically a bra uh, the brain when somebody's listening to a piece of music. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, an MRI scan can look different depending on how much the person likes the song. So uh, if the person somewhat likes the song, it will be more like the greens and the yellows. But uh, it'll be that all over instead of all these blues and reds. And if they uh, dislike the song, it will mostly be reds and oranges and blues. Uh, and if they love the song, it will mostly be all orange. And that, that is if they're playing the song, not listening to it. But this one, as you can see, he probably doesn't like the song or likes it, I don't know, she. <laughs> Even further, playing an instrument causes hundreds of spots in each area of the brain to light up, making it look like a fireworks show. 
This is because playing music requires fine motor skills, which are controlled on both sides of the brain, the linguistic side and the mathematical side. Uh, the music increases the brain's activity in the corpus callosum. Music also affects our memory. The brain gives musical memories and emotional, conceptual, and audio tagged memories, therefore making it easier for the brain to recall certain points throughout life. Doctors formulated a treatment for patients with chronic pains to help reduce the number of pills the patient would need to take. This form of treatment includes focusing on either listening to a song or playing an instrument as a way to distract the patient from their pain. This musical training delays the effects that certain illnesses have, especially in older patients. We see the same thing happening with dementia patients. The person might not remember much about what they've accomplished or what they've done in life, but once you introduce music, their memory is practically reinvigorated. This happens because music helps the brain attach certain songs to the memory. The emotional stimulation of the music directly correlates to the memory. Taking the time every day to practice an instrument increases happiness or dopamine levels, a desire for community, and increases the recognition that God presents himself as a very musical being. While personal enjoyment is not a bad motivation to listen or to play music, connecting that discipline to community has much more value. When we play music, we bring the community together for fellowship to collectively work to glorify God through it. Making music is a unique way for God's people to work together. The piano brings people together, an example being singing carols around the piano at Christmas, which not only comforts the people singing, but also helps everyone work together as one group to glorify God. Planting the seed of fellowship by making music for others makes the singers aware of the body of Christ striving together in ways that went unnoticed before. Our example should affect others in a way that makes them want to partake of such joy. And this is Psalm 8, verses 1 through 4, KJV version. Sing aloud unto the God our strength. Make a joyful noise unto the God of Jacob. Take the psalm and bring hither the timbrel, the pleasant harp of the psaltery. Blow up the trumpet in the new moon in the time appointed on our solemn feast day. For this was a statute for Israel and the law of the God of Jacob. Acquiring virtue means we must internalize good into our character so that we can be free within God's law. The more we abide by the law, the freer we become. By internalizing virtue, the more we become like the kind of person who doesn't need rules. And the more we acquire virtue, the more we are compelled to do the good. Because it is in the very fiber of our being. Just like the basics of learning any instrument. So, does playing an instrument give us virtue? Playing it with the knowledge that we can benefit the community through playing clothes us with virtues of compassion, Kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, which is from Romans 13, verse 14. Jesus commands us to follow him, which means we must align our longings and desires to his. And by learning to play an instrument with the desire to bring the community together does just that, aligning our desires to his and instilling virtue into our being. The brain is widely affected by music and playing an instrument. It not only causes new pathways and channels to grow in the cerebrum and increase the speed of communication in the brain, but it also grows love for music and its creator. It makes a desire for more community, virtue, and a hunger to please the Lord. Thank you. drives away any, you know, selfishness or any of that. I mean, depending on how you go about it. But if you have the right attitude with it, it drives away any anger or sadness or whatever. So is there, is there, I think they're also seeing the connection between music and healing in an illness of David's 
Yeah, it, um, there, I mean, like I mentioned before, there's, they use it to, oh, there was a documentary that we watched a while ago about dementia patients, and they would play a song for this, you know, 80-something-year-old woman, and who doesn't remember anything, and then she'd start dancing along to this music and then tell this long story about how they were, you know, sitting on the porch listening to that song when they were six or something like that. But yeah, uh, music, like I said, has an emotional tag to it, so uh, depending on the type of music you're listening to, it can invoke those kind of emotions. Like some people listen to sad music to feel sad, or um, depending on, you know, the type of music you play, it sort of changes your mood. expand on that point in terms of helping both our mental state and our motor skills with regards to having gratitude? Uh, yeah, well, I recently wrote a paper on uh, the cranial nerves and how it affects mental, you know, status and that sort of thing. But um, uh, part of the beginning of that paper was physical and mental health are, you know, completely correlated. Depending on how you feel physically, you're probably not going to feel great mentally. So, like, if you have a stomach ache, it's going to be really hard to be happy or, you know, act positively towards people. And the same thing goes for gratitude. If you aren't grateful, then it's going to be a hard thing to, you know, act positively towards the things that God has given us. So... powerful is it just as powerful on the other side to your destruction yeah it definitely can like a lot of I think it's kind of popular these days for or I the emo stage that we've all heard of I'm sure if you guys have seen it Probably. I haven't but yeah no. those people definitely no. are affected by the music they listen to because all of the list, music they listen to is very full of rage and like mostly injured towards their parents, which is ungrateful, so. One more quick one, maybe, Rick. Um, have you thought on anything else like music that affects your brain? Are there activities that have come across? Think about music does this. Are there other things that can replace what music does? Or is music irreplaceable in that way? I like studying Hebrew, for Hebrew's sake. Mm -hmm. I can't always say good things. <laughs> He's here. <laughs> uh, I mean, I don't think anything could completely replace it, but I mean, good exercise and a good diet do that too, because, uh, the, well, I've mentioned this before. My dad has probably talked to you guys about this too, but the gut is basically the second brain because it has more neurons or something in it than the brain does. And so, like I said before, physical and mental health are connected, so if you don't feel good physically, you're not going to feel good mentally, because it's going through your intestines and, you know, the digest. Uh, something, something just came to mind. Did you, uh, did you think, uh, did anybody say anything about the different kinds of music and how different kinds of music affect you? Like, for example, is it just regular rock music or pop music as opposed to more complex music like classical music? Yeah. I would say classical music definitely has more effects because you have to focus on so many things at once, although rock music is really fun, so 
is kind of like food. Sugar is really good, but it's not good all the time. <laughs> Oh, well, I don't know the specifics of that, but, the, well, like I said in the paper, the reason that it lights up so much more is because it interacts with both sides of the brain, dealing with language and numbers and sounds. really hard all year long. Uh, some of them are still working, but uh, Marion uh, had uh, close to, what, 50 pages that we ended up with, so uh, a lot of material. Her title is uh, Names in Fiction. Please welcome Marion Markley. Okay, I did reduce it. I'm not going to read 50 pages off to y'all. The popular idiom, do not judge a book by its cover, tells the audience not to think that all aspects of the novel must match the appearance. In this way, readers should not scrutinize the names without grace, because not all authors intend for readers to judge the character based off of their titles. Names have power because readers cannot flawlessly predict their intention. Authors portray character intent, morally good, bad, or undecided, through archetypes and different genres. However, all naming styles connect the readers to the story and convey meaning to the audience. We associate names with personality, character, and actions. As far back as 1948, studies indicated that names affect performance later in life. Chosen names reflect how individuals see themselves, and nicknames reflect how close friends remember the person. They secure actions in history. Names originated with the Greek and Roman cultures and remain constant through the millennia. Biblical stories of God naming his people tell the audience about the importance of names. In Moby Dick by Herman Melville, characters had biblical names, Ishmael, Ahab, and Elijah. Originating from the story of Elijah and Ahab, where the prophet Elijah counsels King Ahab of Israel to, against worshiping the god Baal, Elijah tests the power of Baal, meets on a mountain to call down fire from the sky onto an altar, the priests of Baal undergo torturous worship while Elijah pours water on the altar and asks once for fire. King Ahab sentences the priest of Baal to death and further bloodies the world. Melville draws from the priests of Baal and the story of Jonah to create the plot. Connections between character names and the plot make the reader think about how it might affect the story in general. The hunt for the white whale has many interpretations. Captain Ahab searches for a god, and he hunts for revenge, saying that one character must only have one meaning, convey, confines that text to that narrow translation. The definitions change throughout the novel, even though the style stays consistent. Because the naming styles have remained consistent, authors can write in historical settings. The names given to characters must reflect their personality, the timing, and what the reader believes fits the character the most. Authors know the personality of their characters after they write the story. They must have blueprints for the events before choosing names based on personality or motives. In stories, a name originates from another character. The relationship to the naming person affects the title. By subtracting the unwritten history the book, from the book, the name prevents from the book of the, and the name, it prevents character growth. Authors must consider the setting when writing, especially with real places and times, because different cultures have different commonplace names. Readers do not expect a futuristic sci-fi novel about robot Titanoboas overthrowing the planet to contain a five-paragraph simile about a Western cowboy who lost his boots. Books connect similar names in history and characteristics associated with the historical figure to the people in the novel. 
the lesser known falls into the shadows of the famous historical ones that they draw from. Interpretations of history differ in opinions, textbooks, and the original records. And the same difference occurs between reality and the expected. Traditional historical names can seem out of place in the era, and readers scrutinize these unrealistic historical names. Authors must consider this when selecting era-appropriate names because the readers should not struggle to understand the story. Authors use archetypes, genres, and cultures to fit names to their characters. They fall into simplified archetypes, a generalization of a specific group, the hero, the ally, the mentor, the damsel in distress, and the villains. An archetypal name consists of a proper name that has become a designation uh, for personality traits in an archetype. The names clue readers into the underlying morals and personality traits for that character, whether on purpose or accidentally, and lead readers to anticipate the oncoming events in the novel. The audience must remember that novels comprise the typical modern form and that it has no shape. All the ancient modes of literature had definitions and severity. Writers had to abide by rules, and the category matched the content. A tragedy might be a bad tragedy, but it always is a tragedy. An epic might be a poor epic, but it was always an epic. Modern literature has lost these categories while new genres arise. These genres carry different naming styles emphasizing the driving factor. Fantasy stories had more mystical names. Historical fiction pulls from popular names of the time. Within the first few pages of the book, the authors must convey what type of story that will follow, and readers make assumptions based on that structure. Orson Card redefines genres in chapter five of his characters and viewpoints. He strongly dislikes the distinctions for the genre and finds the term distasteful with the amount of ch changes the definition has. He divides the novels based on the driving factor, milieu, idea, plot, character, and event, which are lovely abbreviated as mice. A milieu story moves to show the setting. The author starts the book in one area, presents a reason for the character to leave the location, advances through the realm, and concludes with the character returning home. This comprises most fantasy, science fiction, and literary fiction. Their names must be memorable and related to the realm, but pleasant enough for the characters to connect with. Idea books follow a question and then answer method. The story begins with a question, follows a character trying to solve said question, and ends with the answer revealing itself. Murder mysteries and allegories fit this category. The characters rarely experience drastic changes, and their names reflect that. Names hint at a specific strength or weakness that the benefits the plot. Character stories follow one specific person trying to change their life. They find their present situation unbearable and find a new role or return to the old way while mourning the lost time. The names in the character stories will emphasize the trait that needs to change to change the life or the dislikes. Readers must understand these characters personally, and the names should connect the readers and pull them into the story. All narratives have events, but the event category holds a specific event, past or future, as the center for the plot movement. The world has fallen out of sync, and the story strives to reestablish the old order or to create a new one. The monikers in these stories will likely adapt as their stories change. As the values and beliefs shift, the characters will lean on names that support their new ideals. Many authors discover a name from historical papers and modify it to suit the story. The etymology of most English words can trace back to either Greek or Latin roots, and this provides a simple reference for mythical names. For example, the magical spells from Harry Potter by J.K. Rowling come from Latin text. When a name copies a pre-existing person or object, the audience notices this and connects the emphasized attribute, whether for similarity or for differences. Other names contrast the character and appear to the readers as unfit or misplaced. The first king in the Chronicles of Narnia is named Frank, a name not traditionally associated with monarchy. Later, Lewis explains that Frank denoted someone of the Frankish race who ruled England after the Norman Conquest, suggesting the aristocratic ideals of gentleness and cur courtesy. Languages present different cultural ties, and in fiction, they can they reference obscure definitions only present in a specific environment. Not all authors intend to allude to renaming depictions, but the reference can apply nonetheless. When Tolkien created the Elvish tongue, he controlled the definition of the names. Sometimes, authors define the origins after introducing the name to inform the reader of what that meaning is. 
No one should regard naming motifs as rules because some authors do not know only re reference or allude to definitions, archetypes, or histories. In Moby Dick, his main character base bears the name Ishmael, a name tied to the story of King Ahab and the prophet Micah from Kings 22. However, one could argue that he chose the name unaware of the biblical reference. He could have heard it as a pet name or some other source and thought it inter sound interesting for a character. Some writers have no distinctive naming pattern. They find a name they enjoy, copy and paste it into their book, and move on. It comes from a stroke of luck and have little to no intended meaning. Other writers dedicate time to selecting a fitting title, bearing in mind that the name impacts how the reader interacts with the story. Many authors change their names throughout editing the book to better embody the character. Conan Doyle renamed his detective Sheringford Hope to the famous name Sherlock Holmes when he decided it no longer fit. He composed notes detailing that John Watson initially had Ormond Sacker as a name. Theorists argue that John Watson came from one of his colleagues, Dr. James Watson, and that he disliked the name Ormond Sacker. Doyle may have taken inspiration from the living James Watson and hid some clues in his name. Choosing names from real life da presents dangers because authors cannot copy people without repercussions. Names and actions must seem natural to the reader, justified in just the right amount of expected. Actions may reflect or oppose the character, but the audience will never understand the purpose of the name or any changes made unto it until they finish the book. Some characters have no name changes because they have no assigned proper name, and any given title exists because of their actions. Nameless characters add mystery and, when written well, emphasize the traits of the main characters by forcing reactions to different circumstances. Named characters can affect similarity, but na nameless characters provide less distraction to the reader and more focus on suspense. Most of the background personnel do not need a name. A story needs some nameless characters to fill out those settings. In Notes from Underground, the narrator never reveals their name when describing the mysterious man and his various struggles. It creates the lifelike characteristics, but instead of connecting the person to the material world with a given name, the readers compare the events to their life. When characters follow this pattern, it may foreshadow a desire for secrecy, hiding identity, intent, or responsibility. Nameless characters allow the audience an alternate style to draw different themes from the story. When context provides no name, we use visuals to identify the individual. We point out a hairdo, jacket, or some other trait that stands out, for both good and bad reasons. The common patterns and stereotypes of cultures affect the persons involved and lead to hasty conclusions. These methods change as often as Perrin changes his name in Children of Huron by J.R.R. Tolkien. Some of the most typical name changes in books and movies come from the people going against society or abandoning their beliefs. A name change marks the start of a new journey to different things whether moral or immoral, and the individual desires to leave behind their previous life and destroys all connections to their name. Chosen names reflect how the individual sees themselves, and nicknames re represent how the others view the person. In Children of Huron, the protagonist Turin changes his name as he tries to escape the doom that follows him. First, he flees Doroyeth and becomes Nethan, the Rot. Next, he dones the name Argoron, the Black Sword of Nargothrond. Finally, he chooses the name Tur Ambar, the master of fate, when Nargothrond falls and he goes to Brethel. Turin ran from his responsibilities for the death of his armies and allies, and every time he refused counsel, he blames the na his name and the connection to his father. Not all name changes have negative effects. Adaptations can use happy memories and activities. Most nicknames originate from amusing events and serve as playful reminders. Once the name crosses into negative aspects, it becomes an insult. These made-up names translate the emotion and memories when dwelling on the name bearer and the change between groups. Though not a fictional piece, the Bible contains multiple records of name changing. God chose specific names to fulfill certain purposes in the narrative of the Bible, and the authors do the same thing when choosing the first draft names and refining them to the final copy. When writers select names for their characters, they will vary the spellings and title combinations to make the characters memorable. The individuals must fit the general expectations of the reader, but also break the stereotypes enough to remain in the memories. Without the name, the readers disconnect and the characters die with the interest of the audience.
Writers use name to emphasize the motives, personality, background, relationships, and the reliability of the characters. Names fill this role by demonstrating the character development and changes on the archetypal and personal levels. They spend the entirety of, entirety of the novel searching for and discovering the meaning of and living up to their names. Without the name, the reader cannot easily keep track of events. They fail to connect the story to their life, and the book loses the history that pulls them in. Names immerse the audience in the story, and the connection gives the characters life as the readers further the details in their minds. The power of names and the interpretation skill of the reader changes the effect on the novel and tears the story apart if used incorrectly. Fiction would not have the same power without names, and the bright lifelike qualities would fade, and the story becomes no more than inked words on dull paper. Thank you. in the Hebrew class today, um, the name Nabal is probably not his actual name, seeing as it means fool. But the names that we call our friends and the people around us affect how we view that relationship. So if you call someone by, say, like they, they don't like their first name, so they go by their middle name. That's a, that's a personal preference that like represents the relationship with their name. And so by doing that, it shows that certain things have changed with that person, especially if they changed their one name, like if they started out with using their first name and then changed their second name. Does that answer your question, or is that yeah. not specific enough? That's helpful. I, I, I was thinking about how uh, names affect you in terms of molding you and shaping your direction in life and who you become. So if you have a name similar to someone else, like say you have the name of a, a famous politician, then you are going to hear a lot about that politician whenever you are introducing yourself and say, hey, my name is such and such. Your people are going to make that connection to someone else they already know with that name, and then they're going to apply that to you, and then you're going to hear that a lot in your life, and that's going to shape how you learn and grow. So sort of like Jacob. By having a name with a meaning and knowing that meaning, you will subconsciously follow that or intentionally differ from that. Let me, let me real quickly give you one more kind of a, kind of a, a application. What, as we talk about what is the significance of being named, having a name given to you, or naming yourself? So the significance would be that it separates you so names were originally created to um, distinguish who is who, and so names give you connections to family and to other stuff like that, but by naming yourself, you cut off everything that you had and you restart, and that makes it to where, by doing that in a way, because God names everyone, God gives the ideas up to the parents of what they should be naming their children. So if you change that name, you're in a way going against what your parents have given you, which it's not to say name changes are bad. Some people are given really unfortunate names and they <laughs> should change their name. But in general, I'd say if you're just doing it, to, you're probably doing it to spite your parents or despite whoever gave you that name. On, I mean, it, in the history of the world, naming was important to a lot of people, to the Greeks, the ancients, uh, but moderns tend to not take that through, right? Don't tolerate kid, whatever. It sounds like a cool name that year. They don't really think about the meaning of it much. Why do you think that is? Or um, I had a 
actually my actual thesis that talked about that, but I cut it out for sake of time. And it's basically, you follow what seems popular because it seems like it'd be the best thing. It's literature, especially, it shapes the culture. So as the culture degrades, the common and the well, the beloved literature will also not be as good. So the names will also reflect that because whatever's gonna be the most popular name is gonna be what is considered the best name. Like, and then there's gonna be the people that completely branch off from that. Like there's a lady who named her daughter and the girl's name has like a thousand different letters in it. And it takes us all 13 minutes for her to say her name. And there's just gonna be people that want to follow the trends of the world and that want to have that best name and people that want to be original and it's a hit or miss on what type of person that, that you are. Does that answer your question? Yeah. My, my question is similar. Uh, in, a, in a world that wants to reject the true author, wants to reject that life has any meaning whatsoever, mm -hmm. um, to reflect that, they'll select a name they, they don't have any intended meaning for these other stories. Uh, and you mentioned that some will write uh, without having an intended meaning. How would you defend, you mentioned that you, there's still going to be cultural associations. How would you defend if someone said, nope, I, I wanted no meaning, my character's living in a meaningless world, there's no meaning to his name. How would you defend you coming in saying, well, this name connects to this story and that story. So they're both right and wrong. So they're right that they're saying that they think it has no meaning, but to some other reader, it might have meaning. So that's why all names that you pick are gonna have meaning in some other language or some other culture. So if you were to say, pick a name that means a certain thing in English, it might mean something completely different in another language from another country. And depending on what reader you have, it's gonna mean something different to them. And if an author says that they don't have a meaning in their name, they're just saying that because they don't want to admit that there's a meaning in the name or they haven't thought about that because they might have just picked something and thought it sounded cool and just went with it. Right, so there's a community of stories that they want to rem remove themselves yeah, from. They want to be unique and different and in reality, they're just picking a different category to fall into. So do you see this study as um, showing the importance of shared story and strengthening adaptation to... Would you mind rephrasing that question? I'm sorry? Would you rephrase that question? Uh, in reading stories where characters have a meaning to their name, does that reinforce um, the uh, communal stories that we should all be reading and enjoying ourselves? I would say you know, it does, but it's not necessary. Like I said multiple times, you don't need names in books. There are books that have no names. There are books that only go by last names, so you don't know what their first name is. So you have that cut off from the personal connection. So it's just a different method to get the story. So, but whenever you have names and stories, you need, you, you end up having that strengthening for other stories. So no one could name their character Harry Potter because we already have a distinction for that. And if you were to do that, you would be trying to draw away from that. Also, it's trademarked, but details. <laughs> but in general, I'd say like culturally, you have certain names that you're gonna be drawn to, like I said. And so the stories that you like are gonna be reflective of that. So you're gonna like someone who's got a, 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 you're either gonna like books that have similar names to yours or you're gonna like books that have names completely opposite of yours. Cause either you're gonna see yourself in that character because of their name or you're gonna see it because of their opposite of your, you're like, I wish I was that character. Does that answer your question or I'm completely de deviating? <laughs> So if someone, like, an eighth, you had a story, 
sometimes one of the characters had a biblical name that had a backstory to it. How would a pagan who was reading that book and didn't know the backstory of that person, how would he respond to it? Well, if they didn't know the connection, like if they didn't know the connection between Ishmael from Moby Dick to the Bible, then they probably wouldn't catch it. They would just find, maybe find a different connection, maybe just ignore it in general. They just, they wouldn't see that specific connection. I'm not going to say it's a good technique or bad technique. It is a technique, and depending on the author, you can do it well. But generally, having a name can find you. So, like, say I pick the name Alex or something like that for my character. I'm going to have an idea of what I already want that to be, and the story might require a different character than that. So I'm going to have to write the character. I can use Alex as a placeholder but I'd have to write the character and I might find later that I need to change it. Beth, uh, I may have misheard you, but did you say earlier in the paper that names originated in Greek and Roman culture? Name, okay, so you had like your first name, like you had a first name, but like the naming system of having like two and three names came oh, from Roman okay. culture. Gavin Peacock is next, and his thesis is Orienting Your Goals. Please welcome Dad, Gavin. Life. Without it, we would not be here. Think about the chances that we find ourselves on the earth right now, after disease, death, and toilet paper shortages. Our parents, our parents' parents, and so on, had to have come together for us to be here. If they decided they wanted someone other than who they have now, we would not exist. God has blessed us by choosing us, choosing for us to exist on the earth that he created, where we can glorify God by worshiping him and growing to be more like him by using our gifts for his glory. Let us be mindful that without him, we would not be here. Because of this, we need to bless others with the gifts that have been given to us. We do not need to waste our time as we grow older, but rather need to see how we can help others. As we grow older, we realize that we have a goal that we will generally follow throughout our lives. Goal means the object of a person's ambition or effort, an aim or desired result. That something will most likely become our drive or our main focus. Some people make their job their main focus, others have family, strangers in need, or friends as their priority. The goal we choose will push us to our limits as it becomes a drive force in our lives. The first man, Adam, and his wife, Eve, were given a commandment by God. Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. This gave Adam and Eve a pattern to become more like Christ. Christ is the perfect model, and he calls us to follow in his footsteps as his image bearers. Christ telling them to be fruitful and multiply tells them to enjoy what they were given and to spread this on to their children. By taking dominion of the earth, God wanted Adam and Eve to do their normal daily work, which means caring for God's garden. We should do this as well, observing how Adam had time for family and work. God gave a choice to every man. The choice was to follow God or himself or some object he has idolized. Dante gave a primary example in his Inferno of men who lived for themselves and created their own God. He depicts the suffering of a life without Christ by describing how they suffered in hell. In another example, in contrast, we see Corrie ten Boom choosing to follow Christ and how her life was upheld, with, how her life was upheld despite the suffering and deprivation she endured when she helped others, not caring for herself. In the book One Day in the Life of Ivan Denosovic, Ivan had a goal which was to survive. He was trapped in a labor camp for 10 years with limited rations, cruel leaders, few pleasures, fierce weather, and other people with the same goal. 
Yvonne had to do what he could to live. His goal was that of a selfish man. The book began with things he did so life could be easier for him. He talked about how he woke up on call so he could have time for himself. He'd use this time to grab leaders' boots to save them the trouble of having to hop around with cold feet. He'd gather up bowls to bring back to the get kitchen to be washed. And while gathering, would lick up any morsels he could find. He'd also sweep and clean up storerooms and do other odd jobs. All of the above was done so that he might derive some sort of benefit from officers or get some sort of compensation. Small things like this happened throughout the book as he gave us his advice on how he managed to survive in a very cruel environment. Yvonne had been in this camp for so long and realized any day that he could get sick and die. If living on this earth meant, not, meant just surviving, then we deny what God has called us to do. If we compared the attitude of Yvonne to Corrie ten Boom, the difference is remarkable and that she had something more than survival. She incorporated joy amid suffering by saving others. Today, many people want to accrue wealth for themselves, making that their goal. They tend to work an incredible amount of hours week after week, and they become drained. No energy, no life, nothing to help them except a reorienting of one's mind to a proper goal. As we know from scripture, this would be to follow Christ. If we worship Christ, we recreate ourselves in him so we can enjoy time with family and friends. We will be renewed and able to pursue our chosen work more freely. Life cannot be fun and playing with family and friends. Life cannot just be fun and playing with family and friends. To everything there's a season, a time for every purpose under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to gain and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. We must choose our goals wisely so that it can fit with all these times because we only have so much time allotted to us by God. Viewing Ivan Denosevich, who had only one goal, and that was survival, it was his all-consuming thought. Small amusements were included in obtaining tobacco and other treats, but even in this, the action was only for his pleasure. His companions were doing the same thing. To live right in this area, one had to be a top dog. But even then, top dogs don't mean living in poverty. The possibility of attaining more food or better clothes was a possibility if one were manip manipulative of his captors. Although no one envies poverty, this lifestyle should not be condemned. Sometimes one can find happier people living in poverty than those who possess millions of dollars. By having a proper goal, contentment will be present despite struggles and setbacks. No matter the circumstances, those worshiping Christ will have joy. In the book Generosity Factor, it portrays two men. The first was called the broker. His father was rich and made sure to instill a good work ethic in his son by not giving him a job on a silver platter. The broker worked hard, started a successful business, and was now rich, which was his goal. The first line in the book read, I, have, I love having money, thought the broker to himself as he stepped through the front door of his imposing Long Island home and into the brisk October morning, and I love that I've made it all on my own. His happiness with his wealth and his ability of to, to have obtained it through hard work shows, but his actions also show his attitude is corrupted by pride and arrogance. And continuing to read the book, we find that this is true. When his driver asked him if he could do something extra, such as grab the broker's girl for a dinner he had planned, the broker got upset and said, of course, did you think I'd be escorting the bag lady who hangs out in the front of my office building? Then he closed the divider between them, thinking to himself about how his driver should not ask him those questions. He doesn't get paid to pry into my life. But he also tells himself he pays the driver enough for treating him the way he did, so it's okay. There was a bag lady who was often at the front of the broker's building. The broker considered her a nuisance and eventually called the police to have her removed from the building because she was harassing customers' employees. The broker's only concern was to make money to benefit himself. If others aggravated or disrupted him, he treated them very harshly or just disposed of them. The second man in the, gen in the generosity factor was also wealthy. However, his character was quite different from the broker. He was called the executive. The executive was an elderly man, reared in poverty, who developed a company selling auto parts. To his surprise, one servant grew into a multi-site chain of them. He remembered every day of his 
of his begging with his object to help others the best he was able to, so they could one day grow too. He wanted to give others a chance to spread their wings. A reporter wrote an article on the executive based on his success and how he chose to spend his time and money. The broker stumbled across this article and thought it was impossible to be as wealthy as the executive and give away, give away money. At this point, the broker called the executive to learn more about the executive's ideas. The executive's response was to ask the broker to shadow him for a week or so so he could show him what he did and why. The executive took the broker to one of his job sites and personally gave two of his employees scholarships. He took him to one of his many orphanages where he played with the children and read them stories. The children referred to the executive as grandpa. The executive also took the broker to a school that he had started and was known by all the children. He gave them a lecture where his main topic was about success versus significance. The executive presented the diagram below. So you have success in the left column with the categories under it, which is wealth, achievement, and status. And then you have significance on the right with generosity, service, and relationship under that. The executive was show showing the students the importance of how the world thinks and how they should think. The world thinks as the categories in the success column. If one has felt, has wealth, friends, and powerful positions, and does things others have not done before, one will be very successful. He then showed them the significance of each of these worldly values and how they should be used. When one has wealth, they should share that wealth. When one achieves something, help others attain their goal. And when others respect you, befriend them. Wealth can be hoarded, and that was what the broker was doing. The executive wanted him to share. Sometimes achievements happen at the expense of other people. The broker's driver gives us an example of this. The broker treats the driver rudely and takes advantage of him. The executive wanted the broker to see how others have helped him and helped them in return. Many people, certainly those with status, abuse the power of status because they recognize that others look up to them. So they treat each other, they treat either those below them poorly or befriend them. The executive wanted the broker to befriend those who look up to him, just like those in the situation as the bag lady. I think the success versus significance model gives us an example of how we should orient our goals. We do not have to be rich and famous to do all this. We could be rich in the sense that we can walk and in turn help someone who can't walk by pushing their wheelchair. We can always serve others. That is just one of the ways for us to give and be charitable. Children always look to, up to us as an example, as well as others around us. We can become friends with them and help them grow. The executive has a heart model in which he wanted to instruct the broker. It is as follows. So it has heart spelled out and then he, he owns it all. Every day is an opportunity. Action is required. Remember your blessings and thank him. This was to open the broker's eyes so that he could see the pattern that the executive followed. He owns it all, showing that what the broker has gained can be taken away. So you should use it to the glory of him who owns it all, who is God, who the broker doesn't quite believe in yet. Every day is an opportunity, showing that you should bless people every day at every chance you have. You can bless them with your presence, or something you think will help them, which could be some form of work. Action is required, showing us that we need to obey the Lord and serve him in our actions. Remember your blessings, tells us to remember what God has done for us, and combines a lot of the above. Thanks, thank him, shows us that we need to praise the Lord, prayer sing to his glory, and let the Lord see our thankfulness. At first, the broker did not understand this. He went back to his hometown and all, wondering how the executive did everything that he had done. In the end, he began to realize what the executive meant. He extended help when the driver's wife passes away. He learned that the, ba the bag lady was actually one of his neighbors and was also very wealthy. She followed a similar heart model by walking among the poor in the street and helping them. The book illustrates how those who do not know what to follow or what their goal may be can, fix, can be fixed. Understanding that a goal for one's happiness and wealth is a goal for death and destruction is a life without Christ. Using the success versus significance model, or the heart model, can be shared with others just as the executive did to assist, to assist in showing Christ to someone living in darkness. Not everyone will accept these models though, and that is understandable. The world is filled with sins. Others have different models and ways to go about things. For example, we have Paul and Barnabas. Both were God-fearing men who strove to do his will. That was their goal. In Acts 15, 36-40, they disagreed. Barnabas wanted to take his cousin John, also called Mark, with them to visit the churches they set up that they might strengthen the people. 
Paul does not want to take Mark because Mark has already been with them for a time and had deserted them after they had been preaching for a while. Both Barnabas and Paul end up going their separate ways, Barnabas with Mark and Paul with Silas. They both still have the same goal in mind in that they want to strengthen the churches. God directed them in a different ways to achieve it though. By doing this, the goal God intended was accomplished. Now you have two very strong Christians, Paul and Barnabas, each leading their teams to help strengthen all the churches. The, the work was able to be accomplished quicker, even if others do not want to complete their goal exactly as we do. As long as their goal is to honor God with their work, they can still please God. There are two commandments considered the greatest because they summarize all other commandments. Jesus gives them to us in Matthew 22, 36 through 40. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. This is the basis for all our goals. No matter what we do, this should be our overall goal to fulfill. These words God gave us himself. So if our mission does not follow the laws that God gave us, we need to reorient our goals. Loving the Lord our God and obeying him should be our true goal, no matter what follows. We then need to serve others to the best of our ability, giving up ourselves willingly to help others. Yvonne had no God and did not want to help others. The broker originally was the same way, but a change occurred as he witnessed the life of another living for Christ. And Paul and Barnabas had both of these things as their goal, and they continued to glorify God as they worked. This gives us good examples of living. People can change, and if you can help them, as the executive did, some people may be stubborn, but we will have to try as hard as we can to help them. However, they might not be as hardened as Ivan, and we will have to leave the work of the Holy Spirit to change them as we continue to pray for them. To aid others, our own goal needs to be steadfast. Matthew 7, 3-5 tells us, And why did you look at the speck in your brother's eyes, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your eye. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is true of our goals. If you do not have one, you have the plank in your eye. First seek the Lord as your primary goal, and grow in his grace, thus you will be able to be of service to others. Thank you. I consider that the fact that our kind of culture is falling away, falling away from Christ, so they don't have an example to really follow. They don't know, and they're just uninformed. So my first step would be to lead them to Christ and have the Holy Spirit help me move them. And once they are with Christ, I'd give them examples as like, hey, this is kind of what we do as Christians, and then move on from there. Well, social media is kind of like a fake image. That's what people want them to think of themselves. Like you put the image out there for social media and that's what you want people to think about you. That's not necessarily who you truly are. So people in real life may know that and they'll try and avoid you. And that might just be another example of just Christianity in general. If you aren't a Christian and you're lonely, that's because you're not having fellowship with God. 
So if we're orienting our goals so that we're helping others, that is something that God calls us to do. And if we're helping others, they in turn will be friendly back to us. So it's kind of like a mutual relationship. If you're helping others and you are being a godly Christian, then friendship will come in turn. But if you're going to just push everybody off and be a jerk, then you're not going to have any friends. vocation, which is related to the word voca, which is to call, so we, our vocation is our calling, and we use career, which is related to the word chariot or car, which is the thing that carries us. Uh, do you see those two things as the same, or are they different views? So based on your definition, I, for vo vo vocation, that's a calling. I'd consider that more of something that like God calls us to do and being charitable, while career is what helps us live. Some people make their career like their main focus. That's all they want to do. And they want to work to seem wealthy so that they can hoard money. But a vocation is, I feel like, helps more in the process. So what else would you include in vocation? Um, I'm not sure. So I feel like scripture is more in a vocation because a vocation, since it's a calling, that means there's other things besides just a job involved in it. So our vocation would be to help others and glorify God. So that would be part of vocation. And then with career, it's just what the world has presented to us as a job and you're doing your job. So you have more meaning behind in a vocation. Someone tell me a few years ago that they were, they had a job, a good job that made good money. But he said this is his job. He's waiting for his vocation. He's looking for his calling. But he could consider his current job his calling because he's waiting for something more distinct in this idea of calling or vocation. Uh, thoughts on that? That could go into more of how he picked his job. Maybe whenever he was originally looking to careers, he was just looking for the money. So he went to school and did what he could just to get the job. But he didn't have a, an actual calling to do the job, maybe. So I know that whenever I was looking for a career, I was looking for something where I could help others because that's what I felt like I was called to do. So maybe that's kind of how he went about it. He was just in it for the money at the beginning and he didn't think about the vocation whenever he's doing his job. Wonder, um, so also, think of it this way, uh, your vocation is what God calls you to. Um, so to think that there's a sense in which whatever you are doing, God calls you to it, in a sense. So in other words, um, I'm called to be a father. I wouldn't sit around and like, well, I wonder if that's my calling. <laughs> like, I am one, so I better live according to my calling in that role. Yeah, so, I mean, you were blessed with children. And you wouldn't have been able to have those children without God. So that is your calling, is to be a father. God wanted you to be a father and principal and so on. So God places trials and things in our lives. And if he doesn't think we can handle it, he's not going to put it on our plate. So he tests us. And that's just one of the things, I guess, the same with the jobs. He will call you to do something and because he thinks that you'll be able to fulfill it. And if you can fulfill it, then you're praising him. Does that answer that? Yeah, I think it answers on it. It's, um, he distinguished this like if you were, say, you're, you, um, you just need work, you can't find anything else, so you just, you just take whatever you can get. You're going to be stocking uh, things at a grocery store or maybe a garbage man. Um, in one sense, I think we talked about this as being not necessarily a calling, but a job. Yeah, you're obviously called to do this job at this time, and you're called to provide for your family. So is, is the calling, I wonder, so how do you, in your, um, reading, how do you determine between two possibilities? We know you need to glorify God, prepare ourselves to serve others, but then I'm thinking about what major you're going to be in college, right? If I go to business, I could do this and serve people if I go into this. 
maybe I'll study one thing and do something else. Uh, have you thought through some tools in order to determine two things that are valid, but yet how do I know which one is more useful and glorifying? Some ways to make those decisions. Um, well, God's given us all gifts. So it just depends on how we use our gifts, I guess, and what path you end up taking. Because you choose how you're going to live your life, in a sense. And so I guess it just depends on which way that you're choosing, whether you're going to go towards the side that you think would be more glorifying to God or whether you just want to do your own thing, I guess. I don't know if that's answering your question or not, but... Righteous goals require a righteous person to achieve them. I guess not necessarily because some people do seem like they're doing the right thing, even though they might not necessarily believe in God. It could be that they've just seen actions from other Christians of a righteous behavior and that they want to follow that kind of as the executive, I mean, the broker did. He saw another God-fearing man working, and so he wanted to follow that example. So hopefully by their act, righteous actions, they will come to God as well. Thank you, Kevin. We will have uh, the uh, four others, no, five others, uh, Monday, but we have one more now, uh, Archers. Uh, sorry. Uh, Archer's thesis is The Meaning of Conquest in the Bible. Please welcome Archer Wilson. When observing the Old Testament and New Testament, we can see there is a change in conquest by looking at the battle for the promised land and the mission of Jesus Christ and his disciples. We can also observe a conquest and sacrifice and worship. I will get into that later. Uh, I will also go into, in, go into uh, the misunderstanding of violence as seen by Christians in the world. God promised his chosen people a land to call their own, a promised land, Numbers 34, 1 through 12. But in order to fulfill this promise, they had to fight the nations that occupied those lands. They obtained these lands by the sword and God blessing them in battle. There is a difference between uh, God's violence and the violence of man. In an article by Dr. Lightheart on violence, he says that the violence of man seeks to preserve what is precious to him. It is driven by selfish desires. We can see this in the child who hits a sibling because he wanted a toy the other had. God's judgment is violent, but he is not being wrathful out of disdain or hate. Um, he is refusing to overlook the sins uh, that the people are committing. He is executing righteous judgment. Our culture does, uh, deems it as violence that, uh, because we do not understand. We do not understand the justice that God executes through the means of violence. Our culture's violence is a sinful use of violence. Uh, we do it out of sinful anger and sh selfish desire. So when the Israelites destroyed their enemies, it wasn't unjust or sinful. The Israelites were just bringers of God's judgment on the nations. The Egyptians were a good example of this. Many times Moses and Aaron went before Pharaoh to persuade him to let Israel go. God sent afflictions on the Egyptians and still Pharaoh hardened his heart. Finally, he let them go after the final plague, but soon after went to capture them and bring them back. But God protected the Israelites and destroyed Pharaoh and his army by washing them away in the Red Sea. God gave Pharaoh uh, the opportunity to repent by sending plagues as signs, but he still hardened his heart and turned against God. So he gave him a reason uh, by which he would, it wasn't unjust that he was just giving them. He didn't automatically just destroy them. He gave him signs as, uh, as an opportunity for him to repent. They fought many enemies, including uh, the city of Jericho. By then, Moses had died and Joshua took over leading the people of Israel. They crossed the Jordan to possess the land that God has given them. Joshua sent two spies to survey the city of Jericho. After they came to the city, 
Yahweh told Joshua to surround the city uh, with 40,000 warriors and to bring the ark forward and go around the city one time a day for six days. And on the seventh day, the seven priests shall blow the seven trumpets of ram's horns, and the people will shout and the walls will fall, Joshua 6, 1 through 7. And Joshua did that the Lord commanded and the walls fell. The first thing they did was bring the ark forward. This is a representation of bringing Yahweh out to the front and letting Yahweh lead them into battle. Then they marched around the city seven times, and then on the seventh time they blow the trumpets and shout and the walls fell. This sounds like worship. The blowing of the trumpets and the shouting, singing, are all things we will do in heaven, Revelations 4, 1 through 11. We will sing the eternal song with clashing cymbals and trumpets, Revelations 15, 3 through 5. This is a foreshadowing of the conquest that is Jesus' mission. In worship, we fight against the devil with singing psalms and hymns. The mission of Jesus Christ and his disciples in the New Testament was to bring the new heavens and new earth by the spreading of God's word. As I have already said, singing and worship is the new con conquest for the people of God. Conquest switches to spiritual conquest as we, as we fight the devil in his works. We switch from fighting with the sword to fighting with the sword of the spirit. We don the armor of the spirit each Sunday and go on a holy war against no longer the nations of physical man, but against the principalities and powers of this world. Se 2 Corinthians 10, 4-5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that it exalteth, exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Jesus and his disciples performed many miracles, and preached many sermons to proclaim the holy message to the Jew and Gentile nations. They had many enemies that persecuted and tried to kill them. Uh, even their own people turned against them. One of the main persecutors of the Christians was Saul. He hated and killed lots of Christians before he was converted. After he was converted, Paul endured violence from persecutors and faced death many times. He endured violence that wasn't his, which is what God calls us to do. He did not fear man's violence, but pursued through trial and tribulation, keeping his eyes on the Lord. He became one of the most influential saints of the ancient world and to the mission of the kingdom of God. Now for conquest and sacrifice. In order to draw near to God in the Old Testament, the Jews had to make a sacrifice. There was a certain order the priests had to follow when performing these sacrifices. The first was the laying of the hands. When they lay hands on the sacrificial animal, it is signifying the transfer of sins. Because in order to talk to God, God, we need a mediator and or a substitute. Jesus is our mediator and substitute for our sins. The second step is the slaying of the animal. After our sins have been transferred on the substitute, it now must suffer the penalty of sin, which is death. The sacrifice takes on death on our behalf so that we might be redeemed and cleansed by it. For if we die and we are not redeemed, we will be in eternal damnation Whereas if we are cleansed, we get to enjoy everlasting life with Jesus. The next step is the spreading of the blood on the altar. This signifies purification, just how we are washed by Jesus' blood and made clean, in order to be acceptable in the sight of Yahweh. The fourth step is when the priest put the select portion of the meat of the sacrifice on the altar and burned them up as fire food to Yahweh. This symbolizes our bodies after being cut up and refined and being burned up and ascending to Yahweh's presence to be with him. The last, the last step is when the priests eat the portion set apart for them. This symbolizes a feast, and now since that we have ascended into God's presence, we feast with him in glory. Throughout the whole order of sacrifice, uh, sorry, throughout this whole order, the sacrifice symbolizing us is constantly going through a refining and changing. Because in our fallen state, we are not worthy in the sight of God. So as gold is refined and the dross is torn away, so our sinful flesh and its evil desires are. The order of, sac uh, the order of offerings goes, sin offering, ascension offering, then peace offering. The sin offering represents a cleansing for the priests and the people. They offer it to, to atone for their wickedness through the past week. The ascension offering is a consecration. When Moses and Aaron and his sons offer this sacrifice, Moses puts the blood of the consecrated animal on the tip of Aaron's right ear, the thumb of his right hand, the big toe of his right foot. Moses did this to Aaron's sons as well. This represents that the whole body, even to its extremest parts, is made clean or holy. And the last is the peace offering. 
After Moses had offered up the sacrifice and the unleavened bread, and having sprinkled anointing oil and blood on them, he then told Aaron and his sons to go and boil the flesh of the ram and eat the rest of the unleavened bread at the gate of the tabernacle. This is imagery of a feast after the work of the sacrifice is done. They rest by enjoying the food they prepare. This order of sacrifices is an outline for our liturgy and worship. The first thing after entering into God's presence is confession through prayer before God. We recognize ourselves as weak and helpless without his mercy, and we ask for forgiveness. Then we are assured by the pastor that our sins are forgiven. We are cleansed by God's grace and power and are now able to fully ascend into his presence because God has poured his spirit out upon us. Then there is the reading of the word and the sermon, which leads us to, uh, which leads us to a kind of sacrifice, the offertory. We give to God what is his out of our increase and, our, out, and out of ourselves. Next is the Lord's Supper. Just like what Aaron and his sons did after finishing the sacrifice, they went out and ate the leftover meat. We eat together after God blesses his body and blood so that we are nursed and strengthened by it. Through the breaking of bread, we are growing in companionship and uh, trust with one another. Together, we constitute the body of Christ, and as we eat his body and drink his blood, we are made into one body. Now for conquest and worship. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to uh, stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may, able to, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Ephesians 6, 12-13. The church is in a furious battle against the devil and his works. He has taken over the world and is now attacking the body of Christ in full force. We as God's people are called to stand and fight. To don, to don the armor of God and quench the wiles of the devil and fight with the sword of the spirit. But we have failed in this field. The church has become docile and content with the sin around us. We have become tolerant of evil. We are losing ground because we are not using the resources God has given us. We are, not throwing, behi we are throwing behind us our most powerful weapon, prayer. We no longer fight against flesh and blood. We fight, against, we fight a spiritual war and we wage that war by prayer. Here's a quote from Calvin Beisner that accurately depicts prayer as a weapon. Prayer is, in fact, spiritual warfare. One weapon is prayer for the conversion of uh, spiritual enemies. Another is prayer for judgment on those who finally refuse to be converted. We handicap the army of God when we refuse to uh, use both of these great weapons as he has given us. End quote. We have forgotten we are at war with the devil and we have com become complacent in peace. The devil will not stop for our sluggishness. Uh, he will advance and conquer till we are left with nothing. We are ministers of God that fight for the spreading of God's word, fight by the spreading of God's word. By the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness, and on the right hand and on the left, 2 Corinthians 6, 7. We are all well equipped to fight, but we have lost faith in the one giving us strength. We fight every Sunday during worship through means of prayer and singing. In some denominations, we have taken out certain verses or phrases in the Bible because they are either too gruesome or vivid. We are afraid to pray how the Psalms do, the imprecatory Psalms do. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. In this Psalm, we are praying that God will destroy the means by which our enemies can conquer, to break them down till our enemies are our footstool. This is Psalm 10, 15. O oh God, break the teeth in their mouths. Tear out their fangs uh, and the young lions, O oh Lord. In Psalm 58, 6, we do not understand the price of sin and it is affecting our worship and prayer. Since God is a just God, why would he break the arm of the evildoer or break the teeth in the sinner's mouth? Because God is a just and righteous God who will not let sin go unpunished. Same goes for worship. When we worship every Sunday, we gather with saints all over the world. We become a community which builds itself up. We build ourselves together so that we might fight the devil as one faithful community. Through righteous violence, we conquer sin. We can do this in, ev in the little things, like dealing with a bully or, or enduring a slight from a brother. We can also, it can also be applied to the big things, for example, determining whether to go to war, where, where uh, death and destruction are prominent. But in all, we must fight the good fight of faith, 
lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, 1 Timothy 6, 12. As Paul says to Timothy, we need to fight the good fight, lay hold on eternal life that God has promised us, and have faith in him to deliver us through all trials and griefs, so that we might say with confidence we ran the race that was set before us, and that we did all to the glory of the Lord. Thank you. Since God loves us, he does what uh, will help us. So that may be blessing us through our faithful work, um, or that might be disciplining us for the sin we have committed. Um, God is just in all that he does, and he will do all things for his glory and our benefit, whether it be yet rebuking us, tearing us down because we have built ourselves up on sin, or, I mean, blessing us for our good work. So, I know I, I know I could. That's a whole other thesis thing, but is that I sufficient? Can respond, and you can respond to my response. <laughs> uh, you, okay, God is just, but does anybody deserve to be forgiven? Then, and why do some people get forgiven and others don't? You're, you're, not answering, you're just running around the question. You're not answering. <laughs> you're very good at this. Um. <laughs> uh, Sorry, did you say that one more time? You said God is just, and I'll say, okay. But so then, how can he forgive some people and not others? Because everybody sins, nobody deserves to be forgiven, but he said he's merciful. Yeah, well, God's forgiveness is overflowing, and he gives you the opportunity. So uh, he gives us over to our sin after we turn away from him. So that is why some aren't forgiven, is because they do not repent from their sin and uh, have a penitent heart and do do good after that. They can't just make a false repentance and just keep doing the same thing. That's just them still living in sin. So uh, God God's forgiveness is abounding and he will give it to all his people. But it's just up to you to um, listen to uh, his, his word and to change the way that you have been living in sin. So you will be forgiven if you repent. Okay, one more thing. Um, um, wow. You're persistent. <laughs> Could you rephrase that? So, so it sounds like you're making everything war. And in war, you try to destroy your enemies, and we're supposed to love our enemies. So how can you balance out what you said with the obligation to love your enemies? Well, we are to love them, uh, but yeah, we love our enemies, but hate the sin. So. Uh, we, through not necessarily destroying them, because killing people now would kind of be wrong, but we can convert. That's that's our that's our war. So we fight against maybe not themselves physically, like we're not going to shoot at them or anything, but we will um, like come at come at their beliefs, not uh, in a harsh way, but. <laughs> Coming uh, with love and uh, grace, not to drive them away, but to bring them into the 
hold of God. So we must do it with gentleness, but still harshness at the same time, I guess. Kind of in an opposite town, I was hearing a lot, you uh, declare about not the sword, but the sword of the spirit. Our battle now is spiritual. So um, you know, our Simon Peter jumps up and cuts off Malchus' ear in the garden, and Christ rebukes him and says, that's not how we do this. So are you, uh, is New Testament Christianity pacifistic? Should we really pick up these weapons at all? The metaphor is great from the Old Covenant, where he's breaking the teeth, mm. smashing things against the rock. So that's a great metaphor, and now we are kind of spiritual warfare. So warfare is still the right terminology, but it's spiritual. So we don't pick up the sword. We keep your gu- leave your guns at home. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mean like physical pass- passivity or? They don't believe in going to war. They don't believe in using weapons. So As in, like, physically or, like... Physically. Y'all can believe which one. Like, I'm fine with that. Like, we're just chilling. That kind of thing, or... No, in... in um, so, some, some are called up to serve with the military, and their position is one of the pacifists. We sh- I should not shoot at anyone. We should not shoot with physical weapons. We have spiritual warfare. Mm-hmm. That's what we're told. That's what you're telling us. Yes. It's a spiritual battle. It's a real battle. Uh, maybe even a bigger bigger battle in that way. It's the true battle. Mm-hmm. More than even the, the uh, physical battle in the Old Covenant, which you saw a lot of. Yeah. Uh, we should be being pacifists. We should not go to war. We should not fight physically. That can be a good thing. So if you are, if you are called to that, then yes. But we don't all need to go, go home and grab our guns and just go shoot our enemies. Um, I mean, I, it's kind of beyond the scope of my thesis, but uh, I wouldn't be doing it justice by um, saying what I have now. But I mean, yes, if you, are, if you are called to it, it's good, but you have to understand, like you can't see it as wrong because you have to understand if they are called to do that, they are fighting a, a holy war. It might not be the spiritual one that the church is fighting, but it is still in order to uh, bring glory to God in, in just a different way. So, but that's all I have on that. Sorry. So Jesus uh, gave us his body and blood. So the violence he was done by um, being crucified so that we might be redeemed uh, goes over into that. Um, yeah, so he endured our violence, our sinful violence, and took it upon himself so that we might be saved and redeemed. So um, it's just a remembrance on the violence that he endured for our sake. So like when we eat and eat and drink physically? Well, in the, in the Lord's Supper. What is the Lord's Supper? Hmm? What, is, what happens in the Lord's Supper? What is it? Well, we eat his body and drink his blood and become one. So... Any thoughts on uh, putting the blood on the altar, uh, connecting that with blood over the, the threshold and the, and the plague? Um, when the Israelites did that in Egypt, it was to show the angel of death that uh, there was uh, a sacrifice made for them, so uh, a substitute. And so he would pass over and not kill them. Um, 
this one, I mean, it's obvious to sacrifice itself, but it's also a, a purifying, as I've said. Um, by putting the blood on there, we are, uh, it's a, like uh, signifying the substitute of sin. Um, I haven't really thought. Yeah. Have you thought? I haven't really thought about it now. Other questions? Samson's got one. Uh, so you talked about how God called the Israelites to um, to wipe out the Canaanites because of all the evil they had done in their Egyptian homeland. Um, and you've been talking about how we we're moving from physical warfare. Do you think there may, uh, there could be a, a time when physical violence is necessary? Again, like it was back in uh, Israel's time, when Christians may need to pick up their weapons again and start fighting. The now? Instead of, not now, but I'm, is, is now that we're in the time after uh, Christ's first coming, and we've moved, we've moved on to spiritual warfare, so to say, do you think there is still a place for physical warfare? Uh. Yes. So, I mean, kind of going off what Mitch Ann said, there is, yeah, there's a, a time and a place for that. Um, I mean, it's good to um, fight in the spiritual war and like virgin stuff, but flying bullets at you, I don't know if we'll stop that. But some we will we will need to fight in one form or another for the. Spreading of God's word, and I mean it's mostly a spiritual battle, but there are times when we have to literally take up the sword and fight that fight. But does that answer your question? Yeah. Uh, Isaac. You said the holy conquest is for spirit, um, is for singing and worship. What would be a pagan? As in what weapons against us, or what is there just? The aspect of the holy one is singing and worship. What would be the aspects of the pagan one? Well, it would just be denial against the Lord and a turning away from his attributes and against the people of God. I mean, just fighting every aspect of that. Does that answer your question? How do, how do non-Christians fight? They want to win as well. Yeah, well, in a way they are making themselves God. So uh, by us saying that they are not God and um, Jesus is God, um, they're like fighting for themselves, selfish warfare on their part um, against us and against God because they want to be the uh, mediator of whatever they do. They want to be right in their own eyes. They're the lawmaker, so they will do what is right in their eyes. Uh, for a in the uh, unrighteous kingdom, we're given the spirit of nation now on conquest of the Christians. What is like the what is the effect? Oh, so I'm the pagan and I'm preaching against Christianity. Uh, Uh, God is made up. They're worshiping a something that doesn't exist, and so they're basing their hopes on nothing. But we have lies. Yeah, we have solid evidence. We're here. We can see each other. We can feel things. This is the the world is what we live in, and it's like it's ours to take. So they're relying on some imaginary power. But we have government. We have guns. That is, I guess that's the way we can, we can fight. I felt really wrong saying that. <laughs> okay, okay, sorry. Thank you. All right, we'll have uh, five more on Monday. If you can make it back, we'd like to see you. Thank you for coming.